Today is Tuesday, April 23rd, and we are here as part of our FY20 budget review with uh, our chief assessor, Gail Willett, from the assessing department. I'd like to remind folks that this is a public hearing uh, being recorded and broadcast on Comcast Channel 8, RCN 82, Verizon 1964, and streamed at Boston gov backslash city dash council dash tv i'd ask folks in the chamber to silence any cell phones and electronic devices uh, at the conclusion of the presentation and questions from my colleagues we'll take public testimony we ask that you sign in over to my left there's a sheet please state name uh, any affiliation residence and mark the box if you wish to testify uh, this budget review will encompass around 34 hearings over roughly the next six weeks. Uh, we strongly encourage residents, whether here in the chamber or at home, to take a moment to engage in this process by giving testimony for the record. You can do this in several ways. Come to one of the hearings and give public testimony in person. Come to the hearing dedicated to public testimony on Tuesday, June 4th, anytime from 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. We will be here at least for that time frame and we'll stay as long as we need to to hear from everyone who would like to speak on the budget. Uh, send your testimony to the Committee on Ways and Means, City Council, 5th Floor, Boston City Hall, Boston Mass 02201, or email the committee at ccc wm at boston.gov. Uh, we are reviewing dockets 0622 through 0625. Orders for the FY20 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, appropriation for other post-employment benefits, and appropriation for certain transportation and public realm improvements, as well as dockets 0626 through 0628, capital budget appropriation, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. Uh, I'd like to introduce to my uh, near left here is uh, City Councilor at Large Anissa Sabi George. To my far left is Councilor Tim McCarthy, and behind me is Councilor Frank Baker. I just want to read into the record uh, a couple of my colleagues who will not be able to uh, make today's meeting. Councilor Siomo, I regret to inform you that I will be missing today's hearing on Ways and Means dockets 0622 through 0628 FY20 budget. Assessing Department Revenue Overview on Tuesday, April 23rd at 10.30 a.m. in the City Council's Ionella Chamber due to a personal matter. I will review the hearing online. Uh, sincerely, Matt O'Malley. And uh, dear Mr. Chair, I regret I am unable to attend today's hearing of the Committee on Ways and Means on the FY20 budget. My staff will be in attendance and I look forward to reviewing the recording of this hearing. Please read this letter into the record. Uh, sincerely, uh, District City Councilor Kim Janey. So with that, I want to welcome uh, Gail to the chamber and uh, for your opening statements. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this budget hearing. For the record, I am Gail Willett, Commissioner of the Assessing Department. I'm here today to present the fiscal year 20 budget recommendations for the Assessing Department. As the Commissioner of the Assessing Department, I'm looking forward to continuing to work with the City Council. Uh, has, as has been the case, as has been the case in past, the Assessing Department will continue to provide excellent customer service in responding to constituent issues and questions, as well as City Council inquiries. The Assessing Department is responsible for determining the ownership and taxable value for all real estate in the city. This includes over 160,000 real estate parcels and personal property accounts. Vehicle and boat excise taxes are also a responsibility of this department. One of the challenges the department is facing is keeping up with a very active real estate market to determine full and fair cash values for real property. This is needed to achieve Department of Reve Revenue certification and allow for the mailing of the third quarter bills in January. Also, our department recently completed the first phase of a CAMA conversion. The CAMA system is our valuation system that helps to determine property values across the city. The previous system was reaching the end of its useful life 
The new system was launched in March of this year and is being used daily by staff in the processing of property data and calculating the valuation of real estate parcels. We are currently starting phase two, which includes the replacement of our legacy abatement, appeals, and exemption platforms. Additionally, the department will be moving away from a paper collection system and implementing an electronic filing portal for taxpayers and also for data collection. The existing systems can be improved both on the taxpayer and the city sides and will be expanded to include all department submissions. Uh, the electronic filing portal will be connected to our phase two workflow system as part of our CAMA upgrade to improve the seamless processing of taxpayer applications and internal application review. Uh, the department continues to work on improving the accuracy of our assessments. For fiscal year 19, the abatements are continuing a department trend of historically low abatement number, applica abatement number applications. The assessing department has also maintained a historically low number of outstanding appeals of the department's assessments at the Massachusetts Appellate Tax Board and has protected favorable decisions validating our utility industry assessments through the tax appeal process at the Massachusetts Court of Appeals and the SJC. Maintaining low abatement and appeal filings is helpful in freeing money from the overlay account for the city's use in the general fund. During fiscal year 19, the city is projected to collect $2.35 billion in property taxes. The real estate and personal property value in the city of Boston for last year was $164.5 billion. With my, with my remarks complete, I now turn the floor over to you, Councilor. Oh, thank you very much. Um, could you speak a little bit about, um, just for um, the record, um, the amount of taxes to support property taxes, maybe excise taxes, et cetera, that support uh, our general fund and our appropriations? Oh, uh, so the, I know this has come up in hearings before, um, but it's worth repeating, is uh, more than 70% of the revenue is coming from the property taxes right. in the city of Boston. Um, I think, you know, uh, we're in a unique position where, unlike other cities, Boston doesn't have other resources to go to. There's no job tax, there's no sales tax that the city is getting, or no other source of revenue. Mm -hmm. And so the property tax revenue is incredibly important to our budget. Right, and, and of that 71%, uh, what is the breakdown between residential and say commercial? Oh, um, so the, um, let me pull this up. Uh, so the residential on value is 65.4%. The commercial on value is 29.8%. The industrial is 0.7%, so less than 1%. And the personal property is 4%. Right. Um, doesn't the commercial bring in more revenue, though, than the residential? Oh, absolutely, and that has to do with the um, split rate that we have through right. classification. Uh, so for last year, the residential rate was $10.54 mm -hmm. per thousand, but the commercial rate was $25 per thousand. Right. Same for the personal property. So yes, it is almost three times right. what we get so, from uh, the uh, commercial. Right, so out of the 2.35 that you're at, that's your estimation, for how much of that will be residential, um, paid by residential taxpayers versus commercial taxpayers and you know, other um, industrial? Um, let me take a look. Uh, so the levy by class, uh, residential is 927 billion, um, or I'm sorry, 927 million, and the commercial is 1 billion, 225 million. Right, and, and one of the reasons we have one of the lowest tax rates in the region, I would think, I think we're second to Chelsea now. Correct, yeah. Uh, average tax bill, and uh, is because we have a robust commercial, industrial um, tax base. Mm, absolutely, and, right. and also personal property. A lot right. of the utility um, value also helps offset Bless you. offset the uh, residential value. I would say the other thing is the residential exemption, which right. last year was um, over $2,700. Right, right. 
um, which, which is, those those two things in combination, the classification and the residential speaking exemption. Speaking of the, the, the exemption, um, not to tout my own home okay. rule, Gail, you, but. You should. We have had <laughs> lots of uh, very good feedback from taxpayers who are very excited about that change. Right. So you should. Please well, do. Well, thanks. Could you explain it a little? Because in the past, someone who purchased a home, if they purchased it in a certain time of year, it could take 18 months before they actually realize that exemption. And now there's two times a year that they, it, could you explain how that works for people? Oh, ab absolutely. So previously it was, you had to own and occupy the property as of January 1st. Mm -hmm. And so if you bought the property on January 2nd, you were out of luck until the following January 1st, mm -hmm. um, which is how it could take 18 months because right. the residential exemption did not show up until the third quarter bill that following January. Right. Um, so the change that was, thanks to your push of legislation, uh, was to change that. So if you are a new property owner um, and you buy between January 1st and July 1st, then you would be eligible for the residential exemption right. for the first time for that third quarter bill. So it really uh, shortens that time period so it, it's that you don't have to wait all until the following January to see that uh, difference. And $2,700 is a a substantial amount of money sure. for a lot of taxpayers in the city mm -hmm. that will half their bill just That's getting right. the residential exemption. Right. That was a shameless plug, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I'd like to recognize that we've uh, been joined by Councilor Ed Flynn. And then la my last question is on valuation. I believe this coming fiscal year is a valuation year? Um, it was scheduled to be for fiscal 20. However, in discussions with the Department of Revenue, they asked if we could change that to fiscal 21, which um, also works to our benefit. So the revaluation will now be fiscal 21. Um, the reason it was changed was because of the CAMA conversion right. okay. um, right. and that it is a lengthy process for the Department of Revenue to confirm that our values are accurate when we switch from one CAMA system to to another, and then in addition for them to confirm all the information about uh, uh, the values for the revaluation. Right. So it, it works to everyone's benefit to right. change it to fiscal 21. And I, I'm sorry, just one more. So the CAMA is really um, creating great efficiencies and probably more accuracies. Is that what you've, you're finding or? Oh, absolutely. So uh, the CAMA system that we were replacing was put into work in uh, 2000 as part of the Y2K uh, conversion. Mm -hmm. um, so it had no ability to go to the internet, to connect to things. So the mm -hmm. workarounds that we had created during this period were substantial. Um, we're already seeing a lot of benefit in uh, having this new CAMA system, having the efficiencies that we get from it. Um, you know, the other thing it's changing is it's changing kind of the, the nature of our work. It's taking away a lot of the repetitive tasks. Um, right. This is also the thing that's helping us move away from paper that I Great. think will be certainly helpful for taxpayers to instead go to online portals and put their information in and also for us to be able to collect the information that way. Great, thank you. Thanks for the work you do as well. I Chair recognizes Councilor Anise Sabi george Thank you. Um, I don't know if you want to tell us a little bit more about that residential exemption. <laughs> nope. um, I think next it's great. Hearing. No, we should. Next hearing, we'll talk some more about it. I hope so, because um, it is it is a great thing that we do as a city. The uh, thank you very much for being here and um, for sharing this information with us. Uh, the CAMA process. Are we at 100% now with that in place, or do we plan to be for the beginning of FY20? Um, so we have it in two phases right now. So phase one is the valuation system alone, which is, is running at 100%. I mean, obviously, we still have some bugs that we're working out as we're, we're actively, actively using the system. It's different to use it in a test environment than to actually be using it for input of information. Um, so we have a few bugs that we're working out. We'll continue to do that over the next couple of months. But the first quarter bills for fiscal 20 will be coming out of the new CAMA system, which is a great test for us without the um, uh, heavy lift of the third quarter bill. So we're running that as, as out of the first, the first quarter bills out of this current CAMA system. And what's the second part that we're waiting to put? Uh, so the second phase is uh, workflow systems. It will, right now we have uh, legacy systems that are also 20 years old that were homegrown for abatements, for appeals, for all of our exemptions. Um, and 
Uh, the other piece that this will entail is the assessors, rather than taking paper out in the field, they will be taking tablets out in the field that will have all of their work. So they'll be doing their data entry right out in the field, rather than having this very repetitive system where they're bringing paper back and it's entered and it's being checked. Um, so all those pieces are part of this phase two. And when do we think that will be fully implemented? Uh, right now, a preliminary schedule has it by the end of September. Um, you know, I would say that uh, of the experience that I have in rolling out these new systems, um, you know, there's usually some delay, there's some back and forth. So um, right now, that's the preliminary that's schedule the, is for plan. September. And will that change or necessitate the change in any staffing levels in your department, say for fiscal year 21? It, it may. Um, right now we have a reorganization plan that we've been working with uh, with the budget department. Um, and a lot of it comes out of the changes in the nature of work, of how people are working, what our work is entailing, and efficiencies that we're getting from this new CAMA system. Uh, so yes, we do have the changes that are in the fiscal 20 budget that will go into the fiscal 21 budget. Uh, I think the other piece of it is imagining, it's difficult for me to imagine and other people in the department to imagine how the work will change as part of this phase two until we are a little bit further down the road with it. We're only um, a couple weeks into, into doing the phase two. So we do anticipate for fiscal 21, we will also have some staffing changes. Okay. And then I do want to thank you for your um, participation in our pilot hearing or uh, working session. It? Working yeah. session, thank you. Our working session a few weeks ago. Can you talk a little bit about the pilot payments that have been made uh, during this fiscal year mm -hmm. and where we're anticipating to land for FY19? Um, so I have the fiscal year 18 uh, information. So. Uh, the cash contributions were $33 million. The community benefits credit was $50 million. Um, and so that in total meets 81% uh, of the pilot request, request being met for fiscal 18. Um, you know, where we have been with the uh, pilot payments is uh, this was instituted in fiscal year 2011. It was a five-year ramp up, which would have put it at fiscal year 16. And then the values have been increased by 2.5% in the years after fiscal 16. And so our plan is to do implement the same 2.5% the same increase for fiscal year 20. So what would, what could our potential receipts be for fiscal year 20? What do it, it's, it's hard to say. Um, people don't always pay. It is a voluntary program. Um, I think some of the changes that we've been seeing is that some of the institutions uh, may make a first, there's two payments that are made. Some of the institutions make a first uh, payment and they do not make the second payment. Uh, other institutions like, um, uh, uh, Atreus um, is one that uh, Harvard Vanguard that they have made a larger first payment with the anticipation of they're not sure what the market will bring mm -hmm. for later payments. Um, so it's it's hard to it's hard to predict. Um, and then of all the institutions that participate in pilot that we've identified as needing to participate through the 2011 work, what's their assessed value that we're taxing them on? What is that total value? Uh, So for the medical institutions, uh, it is five billion nine hundred and forty thousand nine ninety five four forty one. So all of this is on on our website. Mm -hmm. um, so it's medical. For the cultural institutions, six hundred and forty three million four hundred and six one sixty two, and for educational 7,288,970,837. And those are 2011 Correct. dollars? Those are two, in 2011 dollars. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Baker. Thank you. Yeah. When, and I'm sorry, I uh, just want to recognize that we've been joined by Councilor Andrea Campbell. Thanks. Good, good morning, Gail. Good morning. So you, you had mentioned low abatement appeals. Is that for the, um, the, um, Owner-occupied units, does that mean we have less owner-occupied units applying for abatements? Or what exactly does that mean? 
Um, no, abatements are uh, something that is filed in January with the third quarter bill, and that is any property owner um, can say, I think I am overvalued or I should be exempt and you are taxing me. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that it is uh, owner-occupied. Um, so for- That's just anybody looking to dispute their taxes. It, that, okay. Correct. Thank you. Um, uh, so when, when the CDCs and those sorts of places, they, they, do they, they don't pay taxes. If, like so Dorchester Bay, do they pay taxes on their, on their real estate holdings? Not uh, to single Dorchester Bay out, but so if, if, if a development CDC that does development, do they pay taxes on all their holdings? Uh, typically, yes. Affordable housing would be would be taxable, which I believe is mainly what Dorchester Bay um, holds. Mm. Um, so yes, things so that are so their buildings affordable. where they they have their offices and that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yes. And and also, if it's an exempt parcel, if it's an exempt entity like um, you know one of the universities or one of the hospitals, and they have a restaurant or they have a bank or something that is a commercial entity in their space, they absolutely the do incentive. pay the taxes. Okay. On that. Thank yes. you, um, Gail. You may or may not be able to answer this, but like um, there was talk last week about rent control. Would you would, would you have any opinion? on what rent control would, would possibly do to our uh, income. I, those, I think, those. yeah, I think it would be detrimental to our income. Um, it would be Will you hard. say that again, Gail? It, it would be detrimental <laughs> to our income. Rent control would be detrimental to the city's income. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the assessments would have to reflect You want to say that, that. again, Gail? I'll say it again. I am happy to say that again. It would be detrimental to the city's income. Thank you, Gail. <laughs> uh, Councillor Flynn. Do you want to say it again? No. I, I, I can, yes. I'd be happy to. Say it, again. <laughs> it is detrimental to the city's income. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. And um, thank you for the great work that you and your staff are doing. And when I pay my property tax bill, I, I do it in person at the track downstairs at the mezzanine level. And the staff that you have there are very professional and courteous and a, a great uh, great knowledge for our residents of Boston. So I just wanted to pass pass along that information to you. Thank thank you. I agree. They're they're a really great uh, really great staff and very knowledgeable. Um, Commissioner, can you talk about the? I'm I'm familiar with it, but can you um, give us a little bit of background information on? Um, property tax assistance for disabled veterans. Can you give a little bit of background information on the program um, and, and what is the criteria for a disabled veteran to apply, but also are, are there ways we can communicate maybe through social media or through some veterans organizations to let more disabled veterans know about the program? Uh, yes, so the veterans exemption, there's a number of different uh, exemptions. Um, so it uh, will depend on either a level of disability with a minimum of 10% uh, as certified by the Veterans Administration. Um, and so it is, uh, the different exemptions are based on the paperwork that we receive from the Veterans Administration. Um, this is something that once someone applies for this and they receive the Veterans Exemption, they do have to apply for it every year. Um, but what we do as a department is we automatically send out the um, paperwork for them to fill out. That's something that they don't have to remember to do. That's something that our department sends out as part of our work to um, follow up with them to make sure that they are getting uh, the personal exemption that they're entitled to. Um, I think that, you know, anyone who has any questions, our track office is a great place to go. They're incredibly knowledgeable about the different exemptions. So there are uh, at least five different different exemptions depending on the paperwork and depending on the level of disability or, uh, you know, award and, uh, being awarded uh, the Purple Heart. Um, I think for uh, getting the word out on this, um, I know that we have, uh, you know, on the elderly exemption side, we've been working with mm -hmm. the Age Strong Commission. Um, and so our plan is to start working more closely with the um, Veterans Commission and the com Veterans Commissioner to uh, try and get the, the word out about this. Because um, it certainly is a great program. We want people to be taking advantage of it who are eligible for it. Thank you, Commissioner. My, f my final question is not, not relating to pilot, but if a if a private business 
owes the city back taxes. Um, what is the procedure for requesting that from them or um, you know, if it's several years delinquent, uh, how do we how do we get back taxes from businesses, or what's the, what's the overall philosophy of your office on that issue? Um, that's actually a collecting issue. Um, so we simply value property, um, but it's collecting that sends out the bills and collects the information. Um, my guess is they would put a lien on it. Are you thinking of a real estate or of a personal property account? Yeah, real estate. Real estate. Um, I think that's a that's a question probably better for collecting. Um, you know, I certainly know that what they do do is put a lien on the property so that they would uh, be able to get paid if it is uh, sold, and it also would prevent someone from getting a mortgage on it or refinancing it with a lien in place. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Council Campbell. Um, thank you, and thank you, Gail, for, and your team uh, for the work that you do. I, I just had um, questions, I think, which were already answered with respect to pilot. Um, um, but also, I guess, quickly on the CPA and, and CPA funding, um, we, can you walk us through, you know, what the previous match was, what it is now, conversations with the State House around increasing that match from the state side in order for us to expand um, our pot, pot of CPA funds? Um, that's not really in my wheelhouse. Oh, okay. I would say that's more the CPA <laughs> committee. Um, uh, so I think it's Christine Puff who is the, the chair of that. Um, I know that there is uh, pending legislation now to increase the um, tax on uh, any deeds that are transferred to try and beef up that pot. Um, I know that when we came into uh, the CPA money a year ago, I believe it was, mm -hmm. um, that that definitely diminished what other communities were getting. So it's certainly an issue that is more than just for Boston, but other communities that also have the CPA. Um, so that, that's the only thing that I'm aware of, but I think that's probably a better, a better question, okay. question for Christine. So you guys aren't in, aren't in the weeds on that. You're just get, collect the money, let's figure this we out. Just, we just put the CPA, <laughs> we just figure the CPA charge, Got but it. it's really the, the CPA committee that's determining how the money is spent or how much money is mm -hmm. coming in. Very helpful. Well, thank you, and thanks for all that you do. Thank you, Councillor Seelman. Thank you. Um, Gail, I, a couple of, uh, we talked a little bit about pilots, and uh, through that working session, I asked for the Massport contributions, and what I noticed was that they fluctuate every year. It kind of goes up and down between 17 plus million and 18 million. What, what, what's the reason for the fluctuation up and down? And, and that I, I do not know. Um, I think that's worth looking into. I'm not uh, aware of what it, the contract is based mm -hmm. on now. I know it is coming up for ex, it's uh, either expired or almost expired. Right. Um, so that that I don't know, but I can certainly look into it and, and find yeah. out. But you're right. It, right. it is not a, I assumed it would be a consistent positive number, and it is not right. necessarily and that. I mean, obviously, it's a, it's a tremendous economic driver, you know, thousands of jobs. Uh, however, it's, it's very impactful on the surrounding neighborhoods. They own a ton of land, probably more than most universities, hospitals, and, and such combined. Um, so, you know, again, we're talking about fair share and contributions. Like, I, I just don't get why they would be going down, you know, this year, for example. Yeah, the, the only thing that I could think of is uh, we are able to tax Massport property that is within the Commonwealth Flats, which is the seaport, mm -hmm. um, and property that they acquired that was previously taxable before mm -hmm. they were where they were created. Mm -hmm. um, so I, that was the only thing I could think is that they are fluctuating because mm -hmm. as they are leasing out more of the seaport parcels, um, like the Omni Hotel that they are starting to build, uh, in the seaport that that becomes taxable under Chapter right. 59. And so I, I don't know if it's being offset by by mm -hmm. what is being paid by on the 59 tax right. side. And obviously all of the shops within the terminals are all taxed because they are revenue generating? No, they are not, no. Really? Okay. Unlike the colleges and universities, if they have a uh, revenue generating entity, Correct, they yes. have to pay the, the typical commercial tax rate. Right, and it's it's the difference in the exemption. Um, Massport is a quasi-public agency right. as opposed to being an exempt agency. Like is it voluntary that. for them as well, or is there a formula, or how is that, how is that ever arrived at? I, 
I'm not. I'm not familiar with a contract that uh, is in place with with Massport. Okay. Um, so I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. All right. And, um, last question for me. Um, the elderly um, exemption, right? Which do you have a, a number of how many elderly actually uh, are eligible um, or actually participate in the elderly exemption? I know they have to. Um, be certified every year, right? Mm -hmm. um, they do. And I know that that's been a kind of bone of contention uh, on how how well we do our outreach to, you know, to piggyback on Councilor Flynn on veterans, same thing with elderly, year in and year out, they have to send in some kind of documentation to remain eligible for whatever the which is seven hundred and fifty dollars or something? Uh, yes, I believe it's seven hundred and fifty, with the potential being matched by the city right. um, for another seven hundred and fifty. Right. Yeah. Um, and you know, I know I've gotten lists in the past of people in my district, uh, for example. Just wondering what kind of outreach and follow up. Um, the department's able to do with the with the staff that you have to you know if somebody doesn't reapply, does anybody reach out to them? Um, it, Sometimes it, it right. depends. Um, you know, if it's someone, and we've certainly seen this on the um, deferral side, if it's someone who defers their mm -hmm. taxes every year and we have sent them two notices, which is our, our typical pattern, is we send two notices um, if someone, we don't hear back from someone. Um, we have reached out on, on some of those occasions, or, you know, sometimes we have personal relationships with the taxpayers that they come in, or we just know them because they've been applying for so long. And so those, mm -hmm. those we certainly do mm -hmm. um, reach out to. I don't have the numbers of how many, mm -hmm. um, how many uh, personal exemptions on the, for elderly um, we have granted with me, but I can certainly find that out. All right, and I know, I, uh, if you don't have it off the top of your head, do you know what the uh, the income requirement is? Is it like a is it fifty thousand for a couple, thirty five, something like that? Um, let me see. No. So it depends on which um, exemption it is. So right. for the seventeen D, it's uh, you have to reach the age of seventy right. and a whole estate. Uh, value of the property not exceeding $40,000. Right. Um, and then, uh, let's see, the 41C is 40000 if single and right. 55000 When if was married. the last time that was updated, that 40000 You know, I, I had looked at this because um, we've been having discussions with uh, Emma Handy and the CFO's office mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, about you know, what we can do to increase this. So mm -hmm. I believe that the 41C uh, limits have not been adjusted since 2004. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly inflation has been moving since mm -hmm. then. And so what we've been talking about is uh, going, I believe we would have to uh, go to the state home in order to- Home petition? Uh, yes, a home rule <laughs> petition. I'll be a sponsor. <laughs> in order, in order yeah. to um, adjust that and right. tie it, what we'd like to do is tie it to a CPI index right. that would allow it to right. move every year as, yeah. as inflation is moving. Yeah, that's 15 years since the last adjustment. Certainly our property values alone have gone up ex you know, extremely high, and uh, I think we need to look at that. But um, Councilor Sabi George, what's that? Councilor Flynn? Uh, and we've been joined by Councilor Lydia Edwards. Do you have any? Councilor Edwards. Hi, thank Hi. you so much. I um, wanted to follow up on a couple uh, lines of questions, but first I uh, was uh, looking to get uh, an update on the back tax, um, the ordinance that we passed last year. That was for the tax arrears um, and the special class of seniors that we have allowed for. So I was just wondering how it's going or how the preparation is being set up. Um, so I, I can speak a little bit to it, but this is, that's really more of a collecting issue since mm -hmm. they're the ones that would put the lien on the property and um, contact people about the collection. So um, at this point, we've been, been doing some data analysis of determining who in the pool, who we have as a pool that owes back taxes, is getting the residential exemption, is not an LLC or a corporation. Um, 
and is also receiving uh, personal exemptions. Um, so, you know, part of our analysis, well, the difficult part of our analysis is kind of determining who meets the age requirement mm -hmm. and who would meet the um, income requirement right now. Um, so I think what we are hoping to do is use some, um, to try and get either some census data or some voting data in mm -hmm. order to look at some age requirements. But at the very least, we think that the pool of people that we would be contacting would be um, people who have the residential exemption and are currently getting one of the elderly exemptions because clearly they would meet both those criteria that are part of, part of the um, 62A criteria. Um, so internally, we've been having meetings. I know there was one that took place. I've been away um, over the last couple of weeks, and so there's one that took place while I was away, and there's another one we're having on Friday for some internal meetings between collecting the law department and assessing. Did, and, and just to make sure, um, we are compliant now with the with our um, with our multilingual notices going out to folks. Um, I think that that was a collecting issue, so I believe that they are, but that's not really um, that's not really under my purview. Okay, um, we'll just follow up then to make sure that we're compliant with our own ordinance. Um, with regard, I know one of my colleagues had said for the people in the back, uh, may have been further back than than him about rent control and and um, impacting the value of city property. Um, is how many of the city property is already under rent control through deed restrictions? Uh, I, I don't I don't know off the top of my head, and I, I would say that those are are still moving every year based mm -hmm. on the deed restrictions. Um, I, I don't I don't know off the top because of my head. rent control does allow for increases as well as does our deed restriction properties. My understanding is that a majority or of our residential properties that we do have are to a certain extent deed restricted. So I just want to make sure that when we're talking about how rent control could impact us, we are also talking about already, or you're including in your analysis, uh, the already rent controlled or deed restricted units that we already have in our portfolio. So they, they are paying property taxes. That, um, mm -hmm. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. And so the, the rent, the well, I would say they're deed restricted deed units. Deed restricted, yeah are paying property taxes, but it is proportional to their deed restriction. I would say that the danger is we have an overall levy that mm -hmm. must be met. So our levy goes up by 2.5% every right. year plus new growth. So that levy will go up from last year 2.5%. That money has to be paid. Mm -hmm. And if it is not paid by the deed restricted units, it will be paid by the market units. Right. Right. No. And I just want to make sure just in the analysis if we're just going to throw in or throw under uh, even the concept when we're talking about it as a city, I wanted to, maybe we just need to do a deeper dive on the impact of rent control on city properties than just outright saying it's going to hurt the value of them. Um, you were talking about Massport pilots. I'm sorry, I came in the middle of that. Um, just run, if you can run the numbers again for me again, how much we're getting in terms of pilot, excuse me, pilot for Massport. Uh, 2018 payment was 18 million 438,531. Uh, payments received from 2012 to 2018, uh, 126 million 480,949. Is so we're getting 18 million total. I thought we were just getting that for East Boston. Is there no pilot, or maybe we're getting tax revenue for other properties owned from Massport? So Massport properties uh, that are within the Commonwealth Flats, which are seaport, are mm -hmm. taxable, and any Massport properties that were taxable prior to them acquiring them uh, are also taxable under Chapter 59, okay. like the auto port. Okay. So with regards to the Massport pilot, is that negotiation still going on? I'm not involved in it, okay. so I I'm, I'm, can't speak to it. All right. Um, in terms of the other... Pilot. I know that uh, my colleague had brought up pilot payments in general. Um, in terms of any negotiation or at least trying to work with the schools on the community benefits component and helping out, I know the cash payments might be harder to enforce, but was there any follow-up on setting or coming together with the community to help define those benefits? Um, so uh, Casey Rock Wilson is the director of strategic alignment for the pilots uh, working in the in the mayor's office and she's uh, someone who has been actively working with uh, the 
pilots uh, on their community benefits piece. I know one in particular was um, Atrius, uh, mm -hmm. Harvard Vanguard, who last year did not provide community benefits just because of the nature of their organization. They're not a typical hospital that is required by the state to have a certain level of community benefits, but they had reached out of their own accord and said they would love to work with BPS on uh, some behavioral uh, training for teachers and providing, uh, you know, help for help for them on, on behavioral issues. Um, and so I know she's facilitating that, uh, that now between BPS and Atrius. So going right. to BPS and asking what, what they're looking for okay. and Atrius uh, reviewing me, and seeing what they can help to provide. Okay. With regards to then assessment, and I recall in our pilot session there seemed to be no willingness or, or, or correct me if I'm wrong about assessing or at least being honest and updating the numbers for the properties that are currently in that that the nonprofits that the universities have we're at 2012 numbers tell me again why we won't get to or get updated 2019 or current numbers for the for the actual assessed value um, it's a huge lift for us to go out and recollect that um, mm -hmm. we are currently in a doing a CAMA conversion, um, that is to collect the $2.3 billion in taxable value that is really our focus for the department. Um, and then additionally, we're moving into a reval for fiscal 2021. Yeah, so again, I think what was proposed is potentially working with community groups to help you with that lift. Um, I know you had proposed it, and that is not necessarily something that I would be interested in, or I think the department would be interested in. I think that opens up a lot of avenues if we have untrained people doing assessments that we are then sending out pilot payments on that are different than the people who are normally doing the taxable assessments. So I think that's a little further down the road than I was even hoping to propose, that at the very minimal you'd be open to the idea, because if the pushback is that it's a bigger lift, then let's figure out what hands can be at the table to help that happen. That's all. Oh, and so, that so ultimately, I, I think uh, it's not good enough to, to me, it's not satisfactory enough to say it's too much of a lift. No, uh, we won't entertain another idea of getting to that. And we'd rather have data that is late or that is not accurate than to simply try and come up with an avenue to get accurate data up for the public. And I would say it's not that the data is not accurate. It is, it is accurate not. It's to, not current. It is accurate based to on 2012 2011. Numbers. 11, excuse me. It's even and so further outdated. With the, the agreement was that it was a five-year ramp up on that. Um, so I think the other thing is, um, you know, the cash payments are uh, $33.6 million. Um, which is nine-tenths of 1% of what we're collecting on the taxable side. Uh, honestly, my I, I understand interest the difference has to in be on what, on what we are collecting on the taxable in, yes, side. I, I heard and that. Please you let have me finish. A different please let me finish. Priority. And but the CAMA no, conversion. My concern is that your prioritization uh, is not allowing. Brief recess. back in session if you want to finish your round answer uh, in in addition we have uh, our chemical conversion which uh, has been three years in the planning and uh, one year in rollout and we're beginning the second phase in addition to the reval that we have coming up for fiscal 21 do I have additional time to ask I'll me? give you some more time sure all right so just as brief as possible make I'm going to be. Very, I want to walk away understanding. Um, yes or no? It's just not a priority to have the updated numbers. It is not. I, okay. I do not think that people That's will okay. pay more if we update it's, the I'm numbers. I'm trying my best to be as efficient right, as possible. Well. So no, it's not a priority. It is not a top priority. No. And even if people are willing to help, you would you are rejecting that. I'm unclear what people would be helping. So I am. What I am offering because you had pushed back saying it was the matter of the amount of work as to why. Initially, that was the reason why, not just it wasn't mm -hmm. a priority, but it was also a lot of work. So uh, you are not open to at least having people uh, trained or somewhat trained or in the community help you with that lift to make sure that we get the updated numbers. Some, I just so I'm clear, it's somebody who doesn't work for the department, doesn't work for the city, that we would be spending time training 
to be able to go out and assess properties. So a typical assessor with no so, experience is a two-year training period for right. us to be able to accept their Would work and be, be able to go to the Department right. of Revenue with Would this you be Is your department unionized? It is. Okay. So that would be a problem, too, probably, just saying. Would you be open to us getting outside consultants or individuals to come? I guess I'm not, obviously, I'm not going to be satisfied that we're just not going to get the information. So can we move on? So <laughs> I don't have a choice. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Gail, thank you, your team. Uh, you collect 70% of all the revenue that we run our city with. It's very important. Uh, one one wrap-up. Uh, what's our collection rate? Um, so I think that's that's something that's probably more in the collection uh, okay. wheelhouse, but I can say from talking to people in collection, 99%. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.